Much of the information being presented by members of the religious Reich on the internet concerning traditionism, is a complete bold-faced lie. If you google the phrase Christian pro-life this is what you will see. Over 56 million results. 56 million and virtually all plastering on the internet how life begins at conception, and abortion is really a murder. If you google the term traditionism, which is actually what this belief system actually is, not Christianity, in contrast, this is what you will see. 18,000. Only 18,000 results as compared to 56 million. The ratio of 56 million to 18,000 is 0.0003%. So what we see in America today is a vast collective deception concerning a doctrine which was condemned as a heresy centuries ago, a heresy that was advocated by Hitler, and Gnostic followers of the Antichrist, who actually thought Christ and the Antichrist were the same thing. They were the very same vegetarian desert ascetic celibates specifically warned against in the New Testament, and called false prophets who had a seducing spirit and taught doctrines of demons. While it might not seem like a big deal to the average Christian, to get confused over when the Bible claims a person becomes a living soul, scripturally it is a very very important issue. Traditionists and political operatives who are attempting to manipulate the Christian public with deceit will attempt to minimize its importance for political purposes. But the fact of the matter is that traditionism is a denial of everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In fact, it's even a denial of the Gospel itself, and thus why the scriptures prophesied that these false prophets were teaching doctrines of demons. Jesus said in John chapter 3, Ye must be born again, he did not say, you must be conceived again. He said born again because he taught along with his own apostles, that birth was the beginning of life not conception. And this is precisely what Jewish law taught not only in Christ's own lifetime, but all the subsequent years following. Denying the very real biblical beginning of life, is denying what Christ taught about it. If you consult religious right sources on the internet, even those supposedly there to battle cults and heresies, you will read nothing about traditionism, and if mentioned at all, it will be presented in such a way the reader will come away from their sight, not only ignorant about its real dangers, but deceived about its completely heretical nature. No portion of Biblical Judaism, or early Christianity adopted traditionism, not even the Roman Catholic Church, which is today the primary source of this heresy. While Rome today denies it actually teaches traditionism, choosing to hinge the entire definition on the simple mechanics of inheriting the soul from the parents, it is not the mechanism by which one is able to wiggle its soul into a fertilized egg that is the problem. It is claiming that human life as a living soul begins at the moment of conception. <laughs> This was the problem with it when it was first condemned, as well as the problem its modified political version holds today. Life does not begin at conception, it begins when God says it begins, and God has made himself very clear in 3000 years worth of prophetic precedent, that humanity becomes a living soul at the breath of life. Traditionists make you think everything is done before a baby is born, and that all that happens at birth is that this pre-existent unborn baby simply slides down the birth canal. And this is nothing more than a medical technicality. But nothing could be farther from the truth. When the baby is born at its first breath of life, massive changes take place in the physiology of the fetus, transitioning it from a pre-born fetus to a baby at birth, that are so remarkable and extreme, they are often described by purely secular medical sources as miraculous. Why? Because the entire physiology of the fetus changes at the moment it takes its first breath. But not only does its physiology change, its state of consciousness changes as well. Observation of these drastic changes has been observed and recognized as the beginning of life for thousands of years, across every version of religion on earth. The changes are so dramatic and sudden, that even the traditionist institute for creation research uses the miracle of birth as one of its own arguments to disprove evolution, because the mechanics in physiology are actually placed instantaneously in reverse at the moment of birth. In fact, even in astrology, which Rome's Vatican has made extensive use of in the past, charts the beginning of the soul at the moment of birth, but not just the moment of birth, but even down to the very first birth. Even in the Vatican's own astrology, this is the case. Why is the breath of life so important? Because it is at the moment of breath that self-consciousness begins. When the umbilical cord is cut, the fetus is no longer receiving the breath of the mother, but it is now breathing on its own pumping its own blood through its own veins oxygenated by its own breath, it has now in the language of the Bible, become a living nefesh, a living psyche, and in English a living soul. This means it is conscious of itself, 
and its life has been separated out of its mother's womb. The actual phrase used throughout the scripture. The following is a direct quote from Institute of Creation Research's own article entitled, Made in His Image, Baby's First Breath, by Dr. Randy J. Gilielsa. Quote, for a baby in the womb, almost everything about those vital functions is just the opposite for one important reason, the baby develops fully functional lungs that are yet inactive for oxygen exchange. Consequently in order for a baby to survive three major structural differences must exist that enable life in his temporary home. First the baby must have a substitute lung, a pretty tall order for even brilliant biomedical engineers. The placenta, a remarkable organ, has a brief existence but it fulfills a myriad of vital functions, especially as the fetal lung and kidney. Second the circuit to the lungs must be bypassed so vessels must change to allow this temporary detour. A new route that deters around a circuit is called a shunt. Third blood vessels must not only connect placenta to baby but also inside from the point of attachment to normal vessels that lead to and from the heart. The umbilical cord meets the need for a placental fetal connection with one large diameter vein and two smaller arteries. Inside the baby these continue as the umbilical vein and umbilical arteries. The umbilical vein carries oxygen-rich blood toward the heart. At a spot next to the liver it connects to a large vein carrying less oxygenated blood back to the heart. Interestingly the two combined streams of blood do not tend to mix. It just happens that when they reach the right atrium the more oxygenated bloodstream is adjacent to a temporary opening in the septum where it passes through to the left atrium because the blood pressure in the right side of baby's heart is higher than the left side, the opposite of the post-birth situation. The right heart still pumps blood to the lungs but because the lungs have not yet expanded the resistance to blood flow is very high and therefore the pressure is high. Some blood does make it to the right ventricle about 10% and flows through the lungs which is the right amount to meet metabolic needs but not for oxygen carrying purpose, which does not yet exist. The temporary opening has a piece of septum tissue over it that is located in the left atrium. Thus it acts like a trap door valve so that high pressure on the right side can push it open with each beat. In adults it would make no sense for the artery carrying oxygen poor blood to the lungs to connect by a big blood vessel to the artery carrying oxygen rich blood the aorta to the body. But the baby does have this big connecting vessel in order to bypass the lungs and send oxygen rich blood from the placenta to the body. Most of this blood travels to the part of the body with the highest oxygen demands, the growing brain. So baby is content in the womb with temporary umbilical arteries and vein a temporary opening in the septum, the temporary pulmonary artery aorta shunt vessel high pressure in the lungs and right side of the heart, and low pressure on the left side. With the onset of labor culminating in delivery, that world is set to radically change. However crucial mechanisms are built into the temporary structures that enable a safe transition out of the womb. Vital circulatory changes occurring at birth. The umbilical cord vessels have features that respond to changes in quantities of oxygen dissolved in blood stretching substances commonly called adrenaline, and trauma. Obviously during delivery and the severing of the cord all of these are present. The cord which has an unusually strong muscle layer surrounding the vessels reacts with a rapid and powerful constriction of the arteries and vein that is complete in less than a minute. This stops blood flow to and from the placenta, which has two effects. It greatly reduces the risk of either baby or mom losing a lot of blood and also causes an immediate drop in the amount of oxygen baby is getting. Very sensitive sensors, inside certain blood vessels measuring carbon dioxide content, and also on the skin detecting temperature drops, stimulate the nervous system's breathing center. Under normal circumstances increased carbon dioxide blood levels coupled with decreased body temperature after exiting the birth canal trigger an irresistible urge for baby to take a strong breath and inflate his lungs for the first time. The lungs have been prepared for this event by special cells producing a compound called surfactant which significantly reduces the tension holding non-inflated lung tissues together, otherwise forces required to open the lungs would be too high for almost all newborns to accomplish. Once inflated pressures necessary to pump blood through the lungs drop 90% from their inter-womb high values. Thus pressure in the right side of the heart immediately drops well below the pressure in the left side. The trap door valve actually two flaps of skin that neatly fold and interlock when pushed together covering the septum's temporary opening of the left atrium is pressured shut. Cells begin to grow over the edges of the valve fusing it to the septum. Less than a minute after birth signals from baby's nervous system cause strong sphincter muscles to close off the umbilical vein where it attaches near the liver and also close off the temporary pulmonary artery aorta shunt. That large vessel permanently closes over the next one to two days. The baby's body has started all changes that continue through adulthood. 
During the next year those internal umbilical vein and arteries transform from blood vessels into stabilizing ligaments. So in the one critical minute after delivery the baby's body has initiated actual structural changes enabling it to survive in its radically different environment with all temporary vessels shunts and openings functionally closed in the first 30 minutes. Conclusion The reality of fetal to newborn circulatory changes is this, structures indispensable for life in the womb are incompatible with life out of it and at birth all structures are rapidly reversed resulting in the opposite effect on survival. End quote. The fact is that traditionists do not like to tell the public the truth when it comes to the miraculous changes that take place at birth, simply because it does not promote their politics and their fundraising drives. But the Bible has been clear on this subject for thousands of years, and the more modern medical science has discovered, the more true the biblical picture appears to be. Massive biological changes take place at the moment of the baby's first breath of life, changes so dramatic secular medical doctors often colloquially refer to them as miraculous. So massive, the Institute of Creation Research uses it as an argument against natural evolution. And whether you like it or not, agree with it or not, or prefer to vote for it or not, the unavoidable and divine biblical fact is that along with these massive biological changes that occur, are changes in the state of consciousness, as well. In fact, the beginning of human consciousness, the beginning of a living soul, a breathing baby, who has been separated from their mother's womb and whom within now resides a soul fully capable of both living and dying as a human being. To undermine the scriptures on this truth, traditionists will point to the Didache, and cite the comment it makes concerning abortion. But the Didache is not scripture. It was not discovered until the 1800s. No one knows who wrote it. It also makes the umbilical claims that everything that has a form has a soul, which is completely unscriptural. It claims all private ownership is actually a sin. And Rome has had a very long and very troubled history of producing fraudulent documents anytime it wishes to promote an idea that is not found in the scriptures. The Didache would be no exception to this rule. Rome's own church fathers contradicted themselves on the subject. Augustine promoted traditionism, but then again he also called the false prophets at Nag Hammadi prophets of God, and these Gnostics equated Christ and Antichrist as the same thing. And the Holy Virgin and the Whore of Babylon as the same thing. And thought Nimrod's demonic rebellion at the Tower of Babel was really the church that Christ started. So really? You really want to quote these people to override the very clear and historical teaching of the scriptures, and even modern medical science, on this subject? Really? Some attempt to claim Luther supported traditionism. But that is an argument that is contradicted by his own confession of ambience on that subject. He was a fan of Augustine so it would be natural to see his sympathy for Augustine's unbiblical position, but it is interesting to note they find a convenient to ignore what Luther said concerning the building of churches, which he condemned to the point of damnation. Roman Catholics have no choice but support whatever personal whim the latest Pope may wish to indulge in his degrees and opinions, but American evangelicals have the opportunity to do much better, and should. American evangelicals have the opportunity to be faithful to the scriptures, and free to use their mind and their reason to stand for the truth. Unfortunately, many traditionists are both violent and malicious because their historical origins in modern history come not from Christianity or the scriptures, but from Hitler's Third Reich which many of these so-called Christian politicians in America are now underway fully attempting to institute in America, along with Hitler's hate, Hitler's violence, Hitler's fascism, Hitler's deceit and Hitler's heresies. Traditionism being only one among many, dirty political tricks in this disgusting bag of depravity. Eric Rudolph, the infamous anti-abortion traditionist Atlanta Olympic Park bomber, who murdered an innocent mother, despite admitting he is Roman Catholic claims he prefers the Nazi philosopher Nietzsche over the Bible when he was asked about his personal relationship with God. No real Christian should have anything to do with this anti-biblical and in many cases anti-Christ traditionist heresy movement, and no you are not defending murder when you denounce these works of darkness, you are defending your freedom as an American to believe in the scriptures, and voice that opinion, which you should never let any politician take away from you, no matter who they are, even if they show up in your church's pulpit.